I'm very glad to introduce Professor McInerney. He's the Professor of Experimental Physics in UCC. So I guess the central topic we're going to talk about is radiation. It's a word that brings out all kinds of phobias and tales of horror and woe. Radiation is something that radiates. Okay, it's uh, something, it could be material, it could be energy, it's something that goes from a place to another place. And um, by that definition, very general definition, it could be electric waves, it could be acoustic waves, it could be just about anything that carries energy or matter from one place to another. In practice, there are two types of radiation that we're concerned with most of all. The first type is electromagnetic, that is electric and magnetic fields that are oscillating. They sort of travel along like water waves, but they can travel through vacuum. If it weren't for that fact, we wouldn't be alive. We wouldn't have any energy traveling from the sun to the earth and warming up the planet and enabling us to harvest energy in all kinds of ways. So electric and magnetic waves are very cool. We like them a lot. Uh, basically, you can consider them to propagate along, and the electric field goes up and down like that, and the magnetic field goes perpendicular to it. And everything is nice. Except, of course, when people start worrying about the health effects of the set of electromagnetic fields, there's the electric field, there's the magnetic field, and there's the direction of travel. And these things can start off, it can be radio, it can be radar, it can be a cell phone, it can be heat radiation, which we call infrared, it can be light, it can be x-rays, and it can be things we call gamma rays. As we go from left to right, or from top to bottom, we're getting more energetic, we're getting more, more uh, forceful, we're getting more, more dangerous, in fact. So this is very low energy over here. And this is very high energy up here. Some of these particles, some of these gamma rays, we call them the cosmic rays, they come from parts of the galaxy, parts of the universe we don't even understand. And they have so much energy that they can go right through the Earth and come out the other side. And we don't know where they come from, we don't know where they're going, we don't know what they're doing. If they hit you direct, if they hit a large, dense part of your body, they can do a considerable amount of damage. But they're just out there, they're just part of nature, they're just part of the universe, you have to deal with them. Another type is solar radiation. The sun is a great big nuclear reactor in the sky, spewing out all kinds of radiation all the time. And when you get these solar flares and mass excursions, you have huge amounts of radiation. If you were living out there in space, you, you would not live for very long. But if it wasn't for the Earth's magnetic fields and atmosphere, we wouldn't live very long. So all kinds of things protect us from that environment. So radiation is mostly natural. There's a huge amount of it out there in the universe. It's a natural and inevitable part of the generation of stars, which is how life persists and exists in the universe. But most of it is up here. I mean, yes, there's visible light. Uh, there's some radio stuff coming out, astronomy. Radio astronomers look, look for that. Uh, only a tiny amount. I mean, we tend to generate light of our own here. A tiny part of the spectrum here, a tiny part of the spectrum there, a bigger part of the spectrum here is man-made. But most of the radiation in the world is natural. It simply comes about because we're part of the universe where radiation is pretty much commonplace. Even the Big Bang, the Big Bang which happened about 15 billion years ago, there's still an afterglow of radiation in the microwave region. It's uh, sort of an echo of what happened at that time. So radiation should, first of all, the first myth about radiation is it's man-made, it's not. Most radiation out there is, is simply natural, it's part of the way the universe works. The higher energy stuff, there's an interesting dividing line, I've divided here deliberately, because up here is what we call ionizing radiation, and below here is non-ionizing radiation. The difference is that these, these, these electromagnetic Waves, they don't come out sort of continuously, they come out in bursts, we call them photons. And these photons have a certain characteristic energy, and the energy goes up as the frequency goes up, which means as we go up here into visible light, right about here, we have an energy, something which we call, if you're in the business, one electron volt. It's the amount of energy gained or lost. If you push an electron through a volt, you get an electron volt of energy difference. And that energy is very important because it's roughly the energy of a chemical bond. It's roughly the energy that binds an electron to its parent nucleus to form a, a piece of matter, an atom, a molecule, whatever. And if you come along with light or with, that, with, with one of these particles of radiation that's less than that, 
the electron is pretty safe. It can just sit there and hang out and you know do its own thing, hold the material together, form a reaction, digest in your stomach, all the things that chemicals do. I mean, we're basically chemical factories. So energy below that tends not to do anything to us unless we really you know put huge amounts of energy in there. And then basically, you know, if you stood inside a microwave oven, it wouldn't be particularly good for you. But microwaves in general are not harmful including the ones that are emitted by cell phones and radars. Unless you cook yourself. I mean, if you stand in front of a 10 kilowatt radio antenna, it would be bad for you. But you're certainly right. You know, that's Darwin's <laughs> Darwin principle at work. <laughs> but generally speaking, this stuff, all the heat radiation, the microwaves, the radio frequency, is, is relatively benign. Above an electron volt, however, the, the, the photon has enough energy to strip off electrons. And suddenly you're faced with the possibility of chemical change. You're faced with the possibility of things like genetic mutations. You're faced with the possibility, essentially, of causing cancer, which is what we fear most of all, because we don't understand how, we don't see it, we don't smell it, we can't tell if it's happened for another 10 or 20 years. So this is where much of the fear of radiation comes from. It's the fact that it's not, it's not visible, it's not perceptible using our normal senses. But roughly speaking, X-rays, gamma rays, cosmic rays, anything, of, even ultraviolet light, which is the sort of high frequency light, beyond the blue and the violet, this is what one has to be very careful of. And as I said, this stuff is all around us. The, the X-rays we use, of course, for, for medical purposes, but there's plenty of X-rays in the universe, even if we never went near a doctor. Um, gamma rays, certainly, they come to us from the sky. Um, they come to us from nuclear reactions as well, but most of them come to us from the sky. The highest exposed population, professionally speaking, is the people who fly airplanes for a living, or the people who sit in airplanes for a living in flight crew. It is not the people who work in nuclear reactors or nuclear processing plants or pretty much anything to do with man-made radiation. It's the people who spend their time up in the atmosphere where the protection is thinner and where you tend to get more exposure to the natural radiation. And of course, if you're doing it day in and day out all the time, you quickly accumulate a lot more radiation than you would if you were living right there on the perimeter fence of a nuclear station, even one that was experiencing what they call temporary te technical difficulties. <laughs> it, it really is uh, a different order of magnitude. Anyway, let me tell you a little bit about radiation just before we go into the sort of more philosophical aspects. Basically, we have three types that we care about. Gamma, as I've already talked about, is electromagnetic. Uh, alphas are heavy nuclei, they're helium nuclei, and they're charged. Betas are electrons, which means that they're light. I mean, they're light in terms of having low weight, not in terms of having not being visible light. And they're also charged. And then finally, there are neutrons. And these are neutral, which is why we call them neutrons. But they can still create havoc. All of this radiation, as I said, it's, it's, in many senses, it's, it's a natural phenomenon. But when we deliberately set out, for example, to produce nuclear fission or nuclear fusion, we're creating some of that radiation ourselves. Whenever we accelerate electrons, we're producing betas, we're producing gammas. Whenever we disintegrate nuclei deliberately, we're producing alphas. Neutrons tend to be produced in nuclear reactions as well. And so once you start producing extra ones over and above the ones that the universe has given you, you sort of have to be careful to, uh, to look after them because they are quite potent, they are quite dangerous if in the wrong hands or if misused. And certainly nuclear weapons, which is one of the misuses of, of this technology, uh, one wishes they were never invented, but of course technology and science, like many other things, once it's out of the bag, you can't really start the thinking again. Uh, these things are rather different in their, in their effects and their properties. Roughly speaking, these things are catastrophic if you're close to them. An alpha particle will smash up your molecules and your DNA and will cause all kinds of mutations if it's within a few millimeters of you. But even a small amount of air, even a thin sheet of paper, certainly even a microscopic single layer of metal will take care of it. So we don't generally worry about alpha emitters unless you actually swallow them or breathe them in, in which case they then become trapped in your body and then you're in a world of hurt. So stay away from alpha particles and you'll be fine. Um, most, fortunately, most of the universe does not emit alpha particles, and if they did, you know, way out in the universe, it won't reach us because they, they don't have a very long range. Precisely because they're heavy and they go crashing into things, they don't travel very far. 
Majors are somewhere in the middle, but they're they're relatively light, so you can you can absorb quite a few of them without any harm. Uh, again, if you're a few centimeters away from these things, they, they won't hurt you. So unless you're physically dealing with handling, pushing, lifting a beta emitter, it's not gonna it's not gonna hurt you. Electromagnetic waves are not that damaging, but they travel very long distances. As I said, we're picking up gamma rays and cosmic rays that come from the opposite ends of the universe. So you can't really avoid them. Um, they are somewhat damaging, but nothing on the scale of these other ones. But on the other hand, if you can't avoid them, what's the point in worrying about them? Again, you don't deliberately expose yourself to risk, like the guy with the radar set. You know, you don't go standing in front of a, a source of gamma rays that you know is, is switched on. You don't go standing in front of an X-ray machine when you go to the dentist or the doctor's office. You, know, you sort of adopt a, a philosophy of prudent avoidance. Um, because they are, as I said, all around us. But again, if you're manufacturing, if you're, if you're producing these rays, you have a responsibility to look after them. If you're in the power business, if you're in the medical physics business, uh, either treating cancer or just doing diagnostics, those gamma rays are essentially yours. You own them, you produce them, you're responsible for them. So that's essentially the way physicists look at these things. Uh, most of these things are out there. You, you try and avoid the ones you know about, the ones you don't know about, what can you do? Um, but on the other hand, if you're producing them, you really have to take great care to make sure that they go only where you want them to do and do only the beneficial things that you want them to do insofar as you can. Neutrons are very special things. Not only are they emitted in various nuclear reactions, but they're also the means by which we produce nuclear power. Uh, neutrons are required. Well, essentially, a new, you take a big nucleus and it's almost like a balloon that's ready to burst. And you slap it with a slow neutron, you essentially throw a, a slow ball at it and it just goes pop. It explodes, usually into two fragments, sometimes into more than two. Sometimes a few gamma rays, sometimes a few of these. Uh, but usually a couple of neutrons. And those neutrons can in turn, if you slow them down, if you moderate them, they can produce other nuclear reactions and you get what you call a chain reaction. And if that is uncontrolled, you get a nuclear explosion, which as I said is bad. You don't want to be around one and we don't want to produce them. And apart from the Americans and the Russians, and to a much lesser extent, the French and the Indians and the Pakistanis and the British and you know, maybe the Israelis and the South Africans, we don't know. Um, they're not very widespread. <laughs> it could be worse. I mean, Iran could have them and you know, other people, North Korea could have them. But anyway, I mean, we're going to talk primarily about reactors, and reactors run on neutron management. It's all about figuring out where the neutrons go and how to how to control them, how to slow them down. But um, typically in a reactor, a reactor is configured as like a big kettle. And inside the kettle you have all these fuel rods and the fuel rods are essentially ready to, to undergo fission. And the thing is designed, it's, it's the geometry of the thing is such that you can't actually have the nuclear explosion. But you can have plenty of other things. You can have an overheating event that causes a steam explosion. You can have reactions between steam and the, and the and the, the, net, the metals that are used in the construction to produce hydrogen, and hydrogen is pretty nasty when it explodes. And you can have, lastly, as in Chernobyl, you can actually take some of the material from the core, which is of course highly radioactive, and in the event of an explosion, it can be dispersed all over the place, and that's not good. But it's not a nuclear explosion, it's not a, an atomic bomb that doesn't have the energy of megatons of TNT. On the other hand, it's very nasty if you're in the vicinity, and in certain cases, such as Chernobyl, where it produces a very fine sort of soot, much like that volcano that gave people fits a little while ago, and that soot sort of gets carried up in the air and dispersed all over Western Europe, and then things begin to get a little bit, a little bit um, difficult. But nonetheless, I mean, they, we're not talking about nuclear weapons. They're an entirely different class and an entirely different set of phenomena, and there's no way that anything that happens here or in any of the other nuclear accidents that happen could turn out to be... Um, which are not to be of that, of that kind of class. It's difficult to think about it now, but even 20 years ago, certainly 25 years ago, in the sort of mid to late 80s, people were still conducting nuclear tests. And I don't just mean little tests, I mean full scale tests of exploding nuclear weapons here on Earth. In the 50s and 60s, they used to do it above ground. So the, the Americans did it in, um, in Nevada, particularly. They did it, some of it in uh, the South Pacific. The French did a lot of it in the South Pacific. And um, the Russians did it wherever they felt like, but usually sort of in 
some of the deserts down in the, what we call the stands now, Turkmenistan and Kazakhstan and those places that they didn't particularly have a lot of influence in the old Soviet system. So there were huge amounts of radiation spewing all over the place and fallout, you know, getting carried on the winds and everything. And, and those bomb tests carried thousands of times more radioactivity than any possible nuclear accident, even under the worst set of circumstances. So certainly in terms of, of radiation exposure, we've had it. We've had plenty of it, whether we like it or know about it or not. And humanity is still here. Uh, I'm not quite so sure about the, the benefits of other things, like fossil fuel burning is immensely destructive. It's millions of times more destructive than nuclear power could ever be. And one of the things I would say to you, I think, I mean, people are not scientists, most people are not scientists. I, I don't think that's a bad thing, by the way, I know lots of scientists, and it would be a very strange world if there were lots of scientists. <laughs> it's best to keep the number within a certain sort of control. I mean, we need scientists, don't get me wrong, I, I love scientists, and I produce <laughs> you know, about a hundred of them every year. But that's about the right number. <laughs> there are no nuclear physicists in Ireland, by the way. The reason being that our government decreed a couple of years ago that there will be no nuclear power in the country, so what's the point of working on nuclear physics? But we do train people in the essence of, of nuclear physics and nuclear engineering. You just can't go and put it into practice. So there isn't a whole lot of activity there. Um, let me say a little bit about health units or radiation measurement. Basically, we're talking about something called a sievert. I don't need you to know what a sievert is. If you specifically want to know, it's a certain amount of energy absorption. It's a joule per kilogram of body weight multiplied by a, what we call a quality factor that depends on the type of radiation, the energy of the radiation, and the type of tissue involved. But basically, one sievert will make you quite ill. If you receive a sievert as a prompt dose, in other words, within a couple of hours, it will make you ill. It will make you nauseous. It will give you diarrhea. It will attack your immune system and the bacteria that live in your gut. And for a couple of days, you'll be feeling not good. But it won't kill you. And over time, it probably won't damage you. It won't cause any major problem with your, your DNA or it won't cause birth defects. Um, a couple of sieverts will probably kill you or will make you wish you were dead. So maybe three or four sieverts is what we would call LD50. It's the dose that will kill about 50% of the people who are exposed to it. Again, if it happens in a short interval of time. If it happens over a lifetime, it probably won't do anything to you. Although it might, it might raise the risk of giving you cancer by 100%. It might double the risk, in other words. But in terms of being exposed to chemicals or smoking cigarettes or you know, any of the normal sort of cancer-causing activities, a sievert is probably way, way down on that. It, it's certainly not of that order of magnitude. If you get four or five sieverts, you're dead for sure. I mean, those are the kind of those are the kind of numbers we're talking about. If you're of the old school, a sievert is a hundred rems. <coughs> so if you get a couple of hundred rems, you're basically dead. Now, roughly speaking, we get about twenty to fifty milli sieverts a year, just by natural, just by being here. Just by what comes down from the sky, or if you're living near a granite, uh, granite is naturally radioactive more so than most minerals. And if there's radar about, hopefully you'll be able to detect it, but that stuff will give you lung cancer. But there's radiation naturally occurring around us, and of, of the order of tens of millisieverts per year. It's what you could get up to this amount, and it won't do you any particular harm. If you go and get a dental x ray, it'll give you roughly a millisievert. If you get a chest x-ray, you're talking about, I don't know, a couple of millisieverts, maybe five to ten. If you get a CT, depending on the region of the body, it can be anywhere from ten to fifty, so it can be essentially a whole year's worth of natural radiation if you go for CT. CT is very high in radiation exposure. Now, MRIs are not so bad, but just about anything you do involving diagnostics except ultrasound is going to involve some form of radiation. And again, it's a it's a risk-benefit analysis. If you go in for get a check x-ray every day, that's going to elevate your risk of getting cancer. Hopefully you won't need to get a chest x-ray every day, but certainly the x-rays that you do get, there's a purpose to them and there's a benefit to them, and you weigh that off against the risk of getting more radiation. But these are the sort of numbers we're talking about. Now, if you're working in a nuclear power station, I think you're allowed to get up to 50 millisieverts in your worst year. You're supposed to have 20 millisieverts max over a five-year average. 
that's per year. But that's when you work there, that's your professional and occupational exposure. If you're living near the reactor, you're supposed to get essentially 0.05 per year, which is a thousand times less than you would get simply by living on the planet. So when I say you would camp out there, right there, I don't know if they'd let you, but if you decided to pitch your tent and live there 24-7, according to the rules, according to the normal standards, you would get a negative amount of additional radiation compared to what you get simply from living on this earth. So these stations are not inherently dangerous. They're not, they're not supposed to be, but people have a mortal fear of them because, well, they're very poor statisticians. We don't understand the nature of risk. We certainly don't understand the psychology of risk. Roughly speaking, if you look at the odds of something happening and, and conduct a sort of scientific test, one of these double-blind trials or whatever, you can assess the risk of something happening or not happening. Of course, you can't tell if it's going to happen to you because it's a random event, but certainly you can figure out the odds and you can affect your behavior accordingly. Most people don't think in those terms. They think in terms of what they're afraid of, which is mostly what's programmed into our brains from our sort of prehistoric DNA. We're afraid of big snarling cats, we're afraid of sort of large animals with tusks, you know, those are sort of lessons that were burned into our ancestors. We're afraid of chemicals, we're afraid of fire, we're afraid of things that can knock us down or break our bones, or things of that nature. We're pathologically afraid of crime, even though as, as a problem it's relatively tiny. But then we're not afraid of the things we should be afraid of. If you look in the Western world, if you look at the developed world, roughly speaking about 40% of people are killed by what I guess you'd describe as cardiovascular or, or blood pressure related things, you know, heart attacks, strokes, and that kind of thing. About another 40% are killed by various types of malignancies or, or respiratory diseases. And then the rest, the sort of, there's 10% due to a sort of alcohol and drugs and traffic accidents and that sort of thing. And then there's another couple of percent for other things. And by the time you get down to sort of one or two percent, you're into crime, terrorism, you know, jet engines falling from the sky, pick your particular phobia. It's, it's a very tiny thing compared to the effects of sort of normal Western high-tech living. I mean, most of the cardiovascular events happen prematurely simply because people are breathing particulate matter that's drenched in organic compounds or tars or carcinogens of one kind or another. I mean, there's, there's a huge excess mortality due to that. And that's mostly due to the burning of fossil fuels. And yet nobody gets that. Because they don't think about it. Oh yeah, people drop dead, they have heart attacks. Why do they have heart attacks? They have heart attacks because of various forms of inflammation, either in their, in their, in their circulatory system or in the heart muscle. And those in turn are caused by ingesting all this other stuff, which you get from fossil fuels. So, I, I'm all for minimizing risk, but you have to understand risk too. So you put your number one, your number two, your number three, and then we get down to maybe 10, 12, 13, 14. By all means, you know, think about what's going on down there. But you really have to worry about what's going on at the top of your list much more than anything else. So there is a bit of a phobia about nuclear radiation and about reactors and all that. And that brings me nicely to Three Mile Island, because nuclear power was essentially started in 1945. It was an outgrowth of the Manhattan Project in the United States. 